Okay, welcome to a presentation about the dimensions of globalization. In your booklet, you've got a sort of table um, with a space for, for notes for each of the different uh, the different dimensions as I go through them. Uh, it's probably going to be quite long, so you know, feel free to, to stop it, pause it, come back to it a different day, have to finish it off. Um, but uh, here we go. So uh, we're looking at the different uh, different dimensions of globalization, different um, sort of aspects of globalization. Uh, focusing mainly on the this the sort of economic more than anything else um, that's often a driver for the social and the political um, for globalization the economics often lead the way um, to look at so first of all it's uh, looking at the flows of capital so capital being money can be invested and spent um, so money flows electronically around the world almost instantly so through uh, internet banking, uh, we can you know transfer and spend money uh, across the whole world. Um, we can invest in companies in uh, all, you know all across the world. Um, you know so straight away, just go online and uh, sort of put in your details, and and we can do that. So money is much more easily able to flow. We don't have to directly take suitcases full of cash and hand them over to somebody, um, or you know we can actually directly just sort of ping ping it across and it, it's gone. Um, areas like the EU um, allow for this money to be moved tax-free. You can just move money very easily and as much as you want from one country to another um, without any sort of uh, issues of problems of doing that. So that allows capital money to be invested more quickly, uh, more simply, without any additional costs. So it encourages more global um, uh, investment across the, the, the world. Um, the high income countries in the world then often invest in low income countries um, and so and that then enables them to take advantage of cheap labor and other costs that may be reduced by being uh, you know having money being spent in an LIC so setting up a factory so investing the money to build a factory in an LIC is going to be cheaper and then you can you know as we'll come back to later you can sell the goods then back into a, an HIC and get higher higher profit margins so it's encouraging this, this sort of flow of money, which then brings everybody into this globalized economy. So that's the, the flows of capital. Next, then, is the flows of labor. So cheap transport, to start with, means it's, it's very easy for people to travel around the world to work. Um, and, uh, you know, even small businesses are able to afford to send people to you know, all parts of the world, all corners of the world, to work because it's very, very cheap to do this. Um, so there's, you know, yes, you can communicate via the internet and so on, but actually, you can send people very cheaply now as well. So you know, there are many um, people who who have jobs that involve them traveling uh, to many different countries around the world, and that's easy and cheap to do nowadays. The goods then can be transferred um, around the world, so. We, we mentioned this before, but you know you can use LIC countries to produce the goods and then send send the work uh, send the the goods back. But it also means that people are moving around the world to find jobs, um, and and so there's a real flow of labour and movement, a migration of people around the world um, to where the work is, rather than necessarily the work coming to where the people work. So the tr transport again is allowing that to occur. Uh, the Channel Tunnel is a, a little example of a, a very um, a very common flow of labour uh, between Paris and London and other other places as well through the Eurostar network um, across Europe. So uh, you know businesses kind of can operate across all of those, and there'll be many business people that are, are very easily sort of flexing between Paris and London and Brussels and so on using that uh, that transport network. Um, so there's a real flow of labour. Uh, around Europe. And then you've also got airport hubs such as Heathrow or Dubai, which again allow a really quick and comfortable transfer of high skilled workers who again can travel, um, you know, to all corners of the, the globe very easily. So if you fly into Heathrow, you can, you know, from the rest of Europe, you'll be able to easily get to, to most places across the world, or if, if not Heathrow, you could go, you know, fly to Dubai and do the same there. And, and you know, most countries of the world 
and certainly all regions of the world are covered by these major airport hubs. Okay, so that's our sort of idea about flow of labour, people moving around to work around the world. So next is the flow of products. So goods can, can more easily be transported around the world. Um, these huge container ships uh, with, with uh, millions and tens, hundreds of millions of pounds worth of products on the, in these containers can move very, very easily around the world and very cheaply um, and, you know, inc incredibly ch cheap. Air travel tends to cost a little bit more, um, but obviously is quick and is, is very commonly used as well. Certainly in passenger aircraft, underneath the passenger aircraft, there's often goods being transported there. Tend to be more high value goods, things that are worth more money, um, because the cost of transporting by air is far greater than by ship. But uh, these huge, these huge container ships really have made quite a big difference to um, the flow of products around the world. Next is then the flows of services. Um, so uh, companies then will often use call centers, for example, in different countries around the world. And you've got an image there of a, a, a call center in Bangalore, which I know we've looked at before, um, which you know can be operating for many different global companies um, and providing that service of, of sort of direct communication uh, of, of support and help to customers, um, you, you know, in any country around the world, but it's done through through this one country. So we've got this sort of service flow of, you know, being able to provide services for people around the world. You know, lots of business services are, are carried out online, you know, with a lot of work being done online. Um, you know, people can work from anywhere in the world, just, you know, they just need to sit on their laptop and they can, you know, they can communicate with different people and send information and, and do their work from, from anywhere. Um, and for example, right now, education, it can be carried out online. It's not, uh, it, it, there's sort of not, not so many barriers to that um, and, and it can, can be effectively done. So services can be provided from, you know, remote, remotely very, very easily. Um, so that encourages different countries to provide services for many different uh, other countries around the world. Again, linking everyone together in this idea of a sort of global economy. Okay. Next one then is the flows of information. So the internet has, has made a huge difference in this area um, because most information is now equally available across the whole of the world. Um, and it's very cheap comparatively to access this um, with smartphone technology in particular. You know, at your fingertips, you've got the, the whole world's, you know, knowledge, really. Um, very little is locked down that you have to pay for or that you have to go to particular places to access. Huge amounts of the world's information are now freely available. Um, so very easily available, but also lack of cost. Um, for, for the whole world. So again, a very global sort of information um, access. In the past, you know, information would be held in, in physical libraries. You'd have to go to the library. You'd have to go and find that piece of information. Or you'd have an individual person who you'd have to go and listen to speak, would have to come and visit to pass on their skills and expertise. But you, now we've got, we've got sort of the Google library um, as it is, and and we've got then you know YouTube and other online platforms where um, you know people can can pass on their information, their skills, their knowledge um, without you know to everybody across the whole of the globe. Um, again, so that global flow of information has really dramatically changed with the the internet. Okay, next then is global marketing. Uh, so advertising and selling. Um, intercontinental advertising is now quite common. Um, so what the companies will do is they'll, they'll have just one marketing team based in, in one country, um, but they will be uh, creating global advertising campaigns. Um, so we can see there the, the, uh, the Coca-Cola campaign and the right there with you know, we, which you probably remember from, from a few years ago with different names on the, the cans, the bottles that you could go out and buy. And 
obviously in in this is in in Africa they you know they picked the the top twenty names I don't know exactly how it worked and they would put them them there and that would be across the whole of the world so that same idea that same way of selling a product was being used in many many different countries around the world um, uh, but it, you know it's it's a very sort of global campaign for the whole world but done by one company. Um, and the same, basically the same for everybody. Uh, and we've also then, you may recognise some of the HSBC adverts, which are quite common, which really does talk about globalisation within their, their adverts. It's, it's sort of one of the main focuses, really. Um, you know, talking about the world sort of linking together and that it calls itself the world's local bank. That's its sort of uh, tagline that it uses. Um, so again, you know, trying to... to it shows that these companies are operating across the whole of the world, but they're operating in a very similar way in all of the different countries in the world. Um, so again, you know, making everyone sort of be advertised to in the same way with the same ideas and so on. So a real um, um, way of, sort of seeing things as being globalized. Okay. Next is then the patterns of production. So this is where you get different uh, a product that's made but has different bits to it going on in different parts of the world. Um, so, you know, in some cases, the things may be transferred back and forth between uh, more than one country before it's sold. And cars are quite a good example of this with all the small little components. Um, so a, com a small bit of a, a car might be made in one country, transferred to another place to be added to something else and then sent back again to be put into the final car. Um, when I was, uh, well, how old was I? 19, I think it was. I was waiting to go to university. I had a job in a, a little factory uh, making um, aerials for car, for car radios. So the, the, it was just these little sort of uh, metal uh, rods and then they had a plastic machine that sort of uh, put the plastic around it to then be sort of screwed on to, to the cars. So and that was all this, this little factory unit was doing and making these tiny little aerials. They would then be boxed up and then sent across to a, a different factory in a different part of the world um, where they would then sort of screwed onto the car. And there'd be all different um, bits of this car being made in all different parts of the world um, before it sort of finally, you know, was, was put together. Um, uh, and so you've got this different pattern of production where these specialised um, little things can be done best in one place and then sent somewhere else, obviously making use of that, that uh, you know, shipping and, and uh, cheapness of, of moving goods around as well. The example you've got here is this uh, is an example of, of coffee, where you can see you've got the sort of idea of the coffee, coffee beans being grown and so on and uh, then drying out and so on and, and roasted in different places. And you can see the whole thing is a journey that um, it's being being taken on and that's a, both a sort of journey in terms of the product changing but also it will be moving as it goes through these stages it's not all done in one place and then arrives instead it travels around the world uh, so you know many products take quite a, a an exciting journey around the world before they end up being purchased okay so on to the is our patterns of distribution so this sort of links very much to the previous slide but we're talking just about distribution now the, the sort of selling of goods once they've been made um, and products we've already talked about this to get transported around the world um, and, and most of those are, is on ships a very very high percentage is on shipping um, and this is generally done to supply high income countries Um, so we've got this diagram here that shows the car industry, which we, we've already discussed, and it shows how goods are moved from uh, the, the sort of major car producing com countries like Japan and Germany and how they're then sort of transported around the world. So you can see that the Japanese that make a huge number of cars, but look at the big arrow, how fat the arrow is that moves those cars into the USA. So a large number of cars moving from Japan into the USA. Um, again, you know, linking those together. You can see from Germany, Germany spreads its cars, you know, very broadly across the world. 
um, into to a range of different countries. A lot come into the, the UK, a lot go into to Japan and, and the USA and so on. And, and it was obviously quite a complex network around Europe um, with lots of different countries in Europe making cars and selling them to each other and transporting them around the world. Um, so that's the sort of pattern of distribution. Um, and if you notice, most of the, the uh, well, in fact, if not all of the countries um, that are um, receiving the goods uh, to a large extent are going to be HIC countries. So distribution generally happens both between HIC countries, so they sell to each other, but they also um, are the ones that generally purchase the goods coming from LIC countries as well. Um, but trade and di um, uh, distribution generally is much more in the richer countries. And you probably remember from your COF index that those countries um, that are more uh, globalized are tended to be the, the same countries as you can see listed on here, um, that they're in the, the, the richer parts of the world, the HICs. OK, and finally, then the patterns of consumption, which which leads li links directly back to what we've just discussed there. So consumption is much higher in HICs, um, but many goods are exported and sold in LIC countries as well. Um, you know, they do buy and they do sell goods as well. It's just that there's far greater levels of consumption in the HICs. Um, uh, as people grow in their wealth, so as countries get richer, they're going to increase the level of consumption. If you have more money, you're going to buy more things from, from different countries. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Um, so as, as parts of the world, such as, as China and other parts of Southeast Asia, um, become wealthier, they start buying more products, so buying more goods, buy, wanting to buy things from the UK, buying things from the USA. So they, they open themselves up when you've got more cash. Um, and available money to spend, you open yourselves up to a global economy. Oh, it would be nice if we had, you know, a, a, a foreign car or a foreign this or, oh, they make the best of these, let's buy them in. Whereas if you're you're uh, in an LIC country, it's much more likely that you don't not going to have access to that. You're just going to have access to the local products. Again, that leads back to that cough index that you saw and the pattern, you know, this is why the richer places in the world, the HICs, are far more globalised than the LICs in the world. Um, the the uh, map that you can see, this uh, uh, the infographic, I don't know how you want to describe it, um, showing the world um, is, is showing oil consumption. You can see where around the world that oil is being consumed, you know, mainly through to petrol and so on now for transport. Um, and it's it's partly linked to population size. Um, but is, is much more so linked to um, uh, how much consumption is going on in these different places. So we can see that for certain parts of the world, North America, Europe have very high uh, levels of, of consumption and other parts of the world, you know, no, notice, you know, Africa is a much, much lower levels of consumption. And even within that total, you can see there are just a couple of countries that actually make up the highest, a very high percentage of that total as well. So there is a few places of wealth within within there, but but, um, but the majority doesn't consume very many goods, uh, doesn't consume much oil, so therefore much, much poorer. Um, okay, so that's the end of the presentation. So obviously you can go through, uh, repeat it if you need to, or pause it as you go through. Um, and uh, fill in the different little sections on the table there.